Hey, welcome to Motorbike Mondays, episode 17. This is Evan from Race Tech Electric. This is Brady from Seaweed and Gravel. And Jared from Seaweed and Gravel. So, welcome to episode 17. Uh, today we are going to be talking about valve, uh, valves and valve adjustments. Um, no, not necessarily about valves, but more so about just uh, valve adjustments. But in order to cover valve adjustments, we have to describe what valves do. So we are talking about it. And what you're looking for. Yeah, mm-hmm. you got to be well informed so you know what you're adjusting. Yeah, well, I mean, know what you're adjusting, but not. Hey. We're not really going into how ju- uh, valves work. Knowledge is well, power, I'm not guys. Describe like what valves are made you know, out of. But I've got I've got an <laughs> episode ready for how what, what a combustion that? motor works. I would love so we'll to hear that. we'll go into detail. Have about you all started that. comprehensive notes for it? In my mind, I have. Yes. Good. Excellent. Excellent. I like this new Brady that is pulling together <laughs> comprehensive notes ahead of time. It's Preparation. Awesome. It's the key to Preparation the is key. <laughs> As we've learned. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so anyways, hopefully you listened to episode 16, um, which was all about triumphs with uh, Dom and John uh, from Close Fab. And I thought that was a cool episode. Yeah, so that was a really fun definitely one. Definitely check it out if you didn't listen to it. Um, it 16 was nice. is not one to skip. Even if you're not particularly interested in triumphs, it was just, it's you will be by the time it's Yeah, really there's up. a lot of information, and they're, they're, just, they're cool dudes, and they're good friends of ours, and... It was fun to hang out and have them on the on yeah, the show. It was nice to hear other voices other yeah. than their own. I like asking questions and hearing answers, so it was uh, it was cool. Very good episode. Um, so, so let's get right into it. Yeah, um, let's. Uh, well, let's jump into what's in the shop real quick. Jared, do you want to start us? Jared, off? you what's go. in the shop? Nice. I don't have a shop. No, I'm just kidding. Not, I have a shop. Not exactly what I. That one meant. sounded good. You hit the note like that was dead on. I'm nice. a, All right, go ahead. What are you trained. working on? Uh, well, I'm working on, uh, uh, my next build. Um, it's another CB550. Supposedly has a bad crank, but I don't believe it does. The motor is like half torn apart. So I'm just going to kind of get into that and try and diagnose and, and, you know, verify that the crank is not bad and, uh, put it back together and get it running. And so I can, uh, can see what the problem really was with it and then get on start the build from there oh that's the bike that was at mike's place yeah um so you you were going you're gonna assume that the crank is fine yeah because yeah, everything that i think the client told me says that it doesn't have the problem had nothing to do with the crank and having the bike in the shop like the oil doesn't smell bad, like, yeah. So it doesn't smell. I mean, it doesn't. There's no signs that say the crank is bad. The dude, the shop that they took it to, didn't even pull the motor out. Like right. the transmission, everything is still in there, and it still has oil in it. Right. Yeah, I mean, you can. There's a possibility you can diagnose a bad bottom end by not splitting the cases. Um, but it would have to be but, extremely obvious, right? Yeah, to, like, I mean, make that call much to. To have a diagnosis, it's a bad crank. Just doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad crank, but it's a bad like uh, bottom end is by checking the uh, the connecting rods for excess play stuff like that, and you're pretty much checking those those uh, guide surfaces and and bearings and stuff like that, which can be done, but it. It's one of the things we'll probably check, or you'll check yeah, yeah. before you yeah. start the. Yeah, so I right I just got into the shop Saturday. Yeah, I wonder why they um, they settled on that. It's kind of weird, but well, they probably didn't didn't know it was wrong or didn't want to do it. Right. They're, they're it seems to me like it had a problem that seemed really difficult to figure out, and it was just like called a bad crank yeah. and get it out of here. From what <laughs> it sounds like a charging system. Yeah, from what the client has told me, the problem, the symptoms were, it sounds char- like charging to me. Yeah. Oh. And how do you, how, how would that be well, cause it was a bad crank? He, he, I don't know. My assumption that if it was a bad crank, it was, say, where the rotor attaches to the crank, possibly that was bent from, like, a down or something like that, like... Something but, was affected there, like the tapered snout on the crankshaft yeah. where the rotor slips on. Very unlikely. I mean, that's the, the bike, bike has to be gone through a lot of trauma for that to happen. Yeah, yeah. and the bike is completely original and completely clean. Like, there's there's right. not even dirt on this bike. It's like the cases are 
pristine. Everything on the bike is like original, just came yeah. out of the shed. Right. It was parked in 1978. And it wasn't like a pre existing problem that he was dealing with at, since he's had it. It was something that occurred. Got it. So. Yeah, that's weird. I think he bought it. He, oh, really? He bought it and then rode it and, the, and it had this problem. Gotcha. But the previous owner didn't know it had this problem. Got it. Well, and it's registered through in through 2014 in Arizona. So the guy he bought it from was obviously riding it and right. registered it last year. Yeah, I yeah. mean, either it's, it's probably a charging yeah. issue. Well, wait, why do you say charging issue? Though? Because the battery was yeah. dying, and that's why it was losing power. It was just lose. It didn't have enough consistent current going to the coils to keep keep it running in all cylinders, kind of thing, and then it dies. Huh. Okay. Interesting. Well, all right. So that's what I got. And we were kind of working on my buddy's little Honda CT70 the other day. Oh, yeah. We were mostly just drinking beer. But, yeah. Uh, I have the XS750 still in the shop, and uh, that is completely broken down um, into each individual part, getting ready for paint. Um, I'll, I'll start that more than likely on Monday. And... Um, kind of just uh have everything separated with the different finishes and stuff like that making sure everything's clean and prepped for paint um and then uh once once paint's done i'll throw it back together real quick and uh hand it off to uh hand it off to evan so he can get started on that and uh at that time i'll i'll bring in my next build which is uh, another cb550 so um that's a quick little what's in my shop um I was just looking at this Miller High Life that I'm drinking, and Miller is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Is that why it's called Miller? Do you ever notice that? No, just that's probably that. a dude's name. Or he is from Milwaukee, so he just put a L-E-R on the end. Anyways. You might be overthinking it. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think you're overthinking I that. just... It's something to think about. Anyways. Uh, I'm not going to think about I, that at all. <laughs> I don't have a whole lot in the shop right now. I'm working mainly on the... Um, the uh, little RS100 project that I got for my girlfriend. And there's a, a post on the website about it so you can see uh, what's going on from when I got it. And then I need to post an update. I'll probably do this week. Um, I got a whole bunch of new parts here for it and um, getting it all finished up, doing the suspension and new top end and brakes and electrical and all sorts of stuff. So. Anyway, it's going to be a cool little bike. I'll post an update about it. And um, that's uh, that's about it. I don't have anything else interesting in here. No no other bikes in this shop uh, except for that never-ending RMZ uh, dirt bike that I have no clue what's going to end up happening to. So, anyways, that's about it. Uh, let's talk about valve adjustments. Yeah, so pretty much uh, what we're going to be going through is uh, how to... Properly adjust your valves, um, how to check for clearances, uh, stuff of that sort, sorts, and um, and uh, I, I guess briefly, I, I guess we'll probably briefly go through like uh, some things to look for if your valves are out of adjustment. But this should be on one of your lists of things to do as uh, for a uh, maintenance. Uh, consistent maintenance yep. uh, task. Um, and uh, as far as Every bike is a little different, or at least the systems can be a little different. How often you ride, or not necessarily how often you ride, but um, uh, how hard you ride, um, how like uh, how much time the motor spends on the higher RPM side can increase the uh, um, uh, amount of mileage, I guess, or uh, decrease the amount of mileage uh, that you may. Uh, need to adjust your your valves or faster they can go out. It of also seat. depends on the particular motor too, because yeah, some are exactly. some are a lot more uh, picky about this than others. Yeah, so I mean it does vary. Um, I would say maybe even just uh, what I usually do. Well, if uh, what I I should do, I don't always do is consistently check them at least. Um, but usually, I end up waiting until. It's uh, obvious that they uh, <laughs> need to be adjusted where, say, I'm hearing some loud ticking in the vi uh, valve train. Um, so if you do hear um, some uh, some valve chatter, um, 
it would be wise just to even kind of check it out, um, check your adjustments. Now, the valve train, a lot of them, especially on old bikes, will have some valve noise, and that is normal. Um, not necessarily a very quiet um, valve train means that it is in adjustment. It, it, it could be... Um, um, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, that a, um, chatter from your valve train doesn't necessarily mean that it is out of adjustment. So yeah, some, a lot of these older right. bikes, some, some just have a noisy valve depend, train, which yeah. is, well, most of them standard. I think are just most noisy them, yeah, valve I mean, trains. Well, you just need to Not get used to what the normal, right, right, right. the normal noise is for yeah. your bike. And some bikes like the airheads, BMW airheads have a really unique, like, Valve sound. clatter yeah. noise. That well, and it's a different noise too. To sound like. So, like your valve yeah. train might be noisy, but your well, I think we've said this are going to be like. I think it's a good idea if a bike is new to you to do a valve it. adjustment right when you get it. Yeah, and yeah. then if you know that they are in spec, then you put the next thousand miles on it. You get used to what it sounds like, and mm-hmm. you know that that's the correct sound. Yeah, and you're not checking these every thousand miles. It's more no. like every ten thousand miles. Or I wouldn't say that high. But I mean, seventy five hundred, I'd say, would be yeah safe as far as like the chances of them going out of uh, adjustment. Different, and bikes. it all depends on exactly the different systems, like a shim style system, um, or nut and tappet will, system. Well, the shim style system, uh, you can a good chance you can get a little bit longer adjustment out of those than say um, your. Uh, Rocker arm type with the lock, uh, uh nut and tap it system. Right. Um, those, um, can fall out of adjustment a little quicker than that, uh, the other styles. But so. the nut and tap it system is so easy to adjust easiest, that there's yeah. like no excuse exactly. for not doing it regularly. Yeah. And so as we get into this, we're going to go over, um, the rocker arm type first, uh, but we're going to, the, the first, uh, thing we're going to, uh, get into is, um, explain, say, like, tight valves and loose valves and what, uh, what we mean when we're talking about that. And then we're gonna get into pretty much this, this, uh, first part is, like, I, I've labeled it getting to the adjustment, um, is what you have to prep to actually get to the position, or get to the, the part to where you actually will take your measurement. So, um, I'll start off with, uh, um, when, uh, you hear tight valves, um, that means that, uh, there is too little, um, of a, of a clearance, meaning the gap between, um, the, uh, the spot where you take that adjust or that measurement is, uh, too small. And, um, the, uh, effects of this is, uh, valves want fully seat, um, on the valve seat. And, um, and uh, some of the things that are bad for this, or why this is That's bad. That's because they won't be allowed to, like, they close won't, fully, Exactly, right? because they're being um, held, uh, held open. Held, so held there's not open. enough travel. In yeah. Kind of. Oh, and do you know what? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit. Um, this is why uh, there is a, a clearance for your uh, for your valves. Um, it's uh, I'm sure we all know that as metal heats and cools, it expands and contracts. And so this gap is to allow for the metal to expand um, and to stay within tolerance and get that proper valve seat. So that's why there is a valve adjustment and a clearance uh, gap. Um, so going back on to uh, tight valves, again, this is too little of, uh, of clearance. So there's a small clearance. Um, and, uh, again, it won't fully seat, uh, the valve, uh, into the valve seat and why this is an issue. Not only you can lose some compression for it cause it's not closing that com- uh, complete, completely seating off, um, so that the compression can leak out through those, that l- very, very small, um, gap between the valves and valve seat, uh, valves, um, expel most of its heat from, uh, contacting the valve seat, um, pretty much that valve seat when it hits that it the it soaks up a lot of that heat, and so when it's not not fully seated, um, it can cause uh, burnt valves or even on the extreme case melted valves um, because you're not sinking heat at like away exactly. from the valve basically. Yeah. And so I mean, so valves, your head actually acts as a heat sink when the valves exactly seat up against. Yeah, because valves, I mean, they are. One of the uh, smallest um, 
uh, in diameter um, uh, uh, parts on the motor uh, that's actually taking a lot of the heat, and so you need to expel a lot of that heat from it, or they'll they'll burn up, they'll warp. Um, and then you can have uh, a bent valve, and that can mess up your valve guides um, and all that stuff. So it can cause a lot of havoc. Now, this is it isn't say um, like a thousand miles of this isn't going to necessarily cause this in all cases, but over time, um, it can do a lot of damage. And uh, valve train pieces and parts are and components are not cheap, so. Uh, you can save yourself a lot of hassle, and uh, and I you'll got, have I, a good running bike, which is more or at least good. I have a question: What does a burnt What does a burnt valve actually mean? Um, it pretty much like it, it's overheated. What, like when you overheat something, it can make it um, kind of brittle, and like you'll notice, like especially on um, on a on a uh, exhaust valves. Yeah. Um, any time that's like really white um, on the surface of it, right. it's, that's a very it's, that valve has been very hot. So it's like can that, also be caused by a lean damage? condition. Like the the valve is like physically damaged at that point, and then it won't seal anymore. Um, it's happens? it's not going to be form performing optimally, um, and. Um, but is it because they like will get disfigured when they get too hot or something, and then they won't? Yeah, I mean that can very much be be a likely uh, cause in case well, of that. Just, I've heard that plenty of times a burnt valve, and I never like nobody ever explains exactly what that means. You know? Yeah. Um, well, I guess now thinking back, I, I I may not have as much information on burnt valves as I previously thought. Well, um, I bet you weren't expecting me to ask those. No, no, super thanks, thanks for making questions. me look like an idiot. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Google's our friend. I'm going to see um, if I can find a, a so description. So, as he looks that up, um, uh, I guess I'll just I'll just cover uh, uh, loose valves as well. Um, and so, uh, loose valve is quite the opposite, of course, of tight, and your clearance is is too big. So you have too big of a clearance, and um, and uh kind of this one definitely is not as damaging as uh as say a type valve um because it is uh it is fully seating so it's not um ri- not at risk of uh overheating that valve um but uh one thing that it will uh uh cause is this is like your this is your very noisy um valve train where excessive noise because what's actually happening is the uh, component that um, um, the valve train component, say uh, your rocker arm or uh, the cam lobe itself um, or cam roller, which we'll we'll all get into these things in uh, in a bit. Um, those are actually hammering onto the the valve uh, every time it opens, and uh, it causes that that loud, excessive ticking um, ticking sound um, and. Um, of course, I mean you are put adding a lot of uh, uh, extra trauma to that valve, uh, the end of that valve stem, um, which uh, isn't always good. There's not, um, it's not necessarily the worst case, um, but um, um, it's a, it's your valves are not a, in adjustment, and so that should be enough to to adjust it. But you're not going to be causing more like. A, uh, as worse um, uh, problems or damage as if they were uh, tight. So um, I looked it up. So a burnt valve is actually like physically damaging or disfiguring the valve, usually from heat on the exhaust valves. And the physical damage to the like outer diameter of the valve from the mainly from exhaust gas escaping around it, and it overheats and it actually damages the. Uh, the outer diameter so it prevents it from sealing to the head okay so yeah. a burnt valve is actually physical damage mm-hmm. to the valve from heat and then you and then it kind of it looks like then it kind of spirals out of control because after it gets hot and damages the valve it doesn't seat perfectly any longer so you so get more gas escaping and mm-hmm. then it gets hotter and then it falls apart more so they actually have like see that picture yeah <laughs> that's a pretty the extreme just one just broken off <laughs> look at that that's actually like a big chunk broken out of an exhaust valve. Yeah. So, anyway, okay. Well, good to know. So, um, 
One thing I didn't cover in here is um, is lapping your valves or reseating your valves. Um, I do have plans to do, or we have plans to do um, a motor rebuild, or at least a top end rebuild uh, podcast, and we'll get into that. Um, we'll probably do that in the future. Soon. Yeah, I'd say within the next episode or two. Um, so, uh, do you want to go over getting to the uh, to the, getting to the valves for your adjustment? Yeah, point? yeah. So, Jared? <clears throat> valves are located on the top of your engine. Um, you want to take off the gas tank so that you can get there. Uh, some people like to remove the spark plugs. It's not necessary, but you yeah. can to... That's just... Uh, removing the spark plugs is just to... Uh, it's a lot easier to rotate the crank. Right, because there's less pressure. compression. Or there's the, no compression. Yeah, there's no compression. Yeah. And then also some people like to... Um, you know, you can look down the spark plug hole and and visually see that you're at TDC when the piston rises and everything. Um, yeah, another little trick for that too is just take any any straight piece of it could be say small round bar or a zip tie and put it down the um, spark plug hole and then rotate the crank. Um, and uh, as that reaches its highest point, that's at top dead center. Yeah. So you don't have to remove your spark plugs, um, but some people like to. It can be just, a lot easier to turn yeah, the engine on. Yeah, it's a lot easier. That, it's more for convenience. It can be done. I've done it multiple times, many times, without the spark plugs. But um, So after you you know, you know pull or don't pull the spark plugs, um, if you have a nut and tap it system, you're gonna, um, there's going to be little tap it covers uh, on intake and exhaust side that you're going to remove. For the most part, not Some every bikes will have yeah. a valve cover for yeah, those. Not well. every, uh, not every bike will have the oh, tap you know it what? covers. That's true because yeah. on the TX five hundred, totally it was nut and tap it. Yeah, and well, this same process cover on the top. applies to dirt bikes and any exactly. other motor, and, and lots of those, uh, especially singles. Will so you're going to take off the valve cover, or if it's nut and tap it, you can just take out the little those. Well, not uh, all the time on nut and tap it, but yeah, um, um, that's, if they have them. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's either going to be a valve cover or those little... Well, remove what you have to on yeah, the top of the engine exactly. to get to the parts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you're going to rotate. You're going to take off your points cover or wherever it is that you get to your um, your crankshaft. Yeah, um, crankshaft and, or flywheel, uh, and, wherever you can manually rotate the crankshaft. And it's going to... Most likely, it's going to be a big, like, 17, 19... 21 millimeter hex bolt and you're gonna you're gonna turn the um rotate the crankshaft in the proper direction that it's supposed to spin um some bikes is clockwise some bikes it's counterclockwise yeah and that all varies on what side you're rotating it from yeah and well yes and it just just depends on the specs like the kz 750 is counterclockwise but it's on the right side of the engine it's strange. Yeah. 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 So just, I mean, usually there will be, say, if you're rotating it from the uh, uh, ignition or point side or electronic ignition side uh, or the ignition side, um, uh, it uh, it will have an arrow or on the flywheel it'll have an arrow which way the uh, the motor rotates. So check that out in your manual, of course, and and even just to figure out this process how to rotate it. And then, so you're gonna you're gonna rotate that to get top dead center. Um, and if you always, I mean, I like to start on one and four, um, but if you're a two cylinder engine, then, you know, you're just, yeah, go to pretty much like cylinder. we're just going to be covering how to do one, one cylinder. And so if you're, say you have a twin or a four cylinder you or three cylinder, or three um, times. yeah, just do this for each cylinder. Uh, there are, we've mentioned, or I don't believe we mentioned that in the dead episode, <laughs> but, um, the unspeakable. Uh, yeah, there are um, systems that, like how, like sometimes in the manual, it says you align, uh, say we're just, for instance, on like a, a four-cylinder, inline four, uh, line up the uh, mark, the flywheel and, crate and case mark to like one and four T, which is top dead center for uh, cylinders one and four. And... Um, and then they have like a diagram saying which valves are loose at that point, and you can make adjustments to those ones on that on that uh, crank position. Um, what makes it a lot easier, I find, is just doing just getting um, top dead center on the compression stroke um, of each cylinder. I'm doing it and rotate the crank 
uh, as it applies to each different cylinder. It's just yeah. a lot easier you know to keep track. Sure. Yeah. But uh, that G- your GSXR that you sold was that way. Like it had a in the manual had like a diagram showing yeah. what point you were at and what was available for exactly. adjustment at that point. It so. was pretty nice. Yeah, I mean, people over the manual and, and manufacturer do that just so you only have to rotate the motor, say, twice right. rather than each individual I, time. I would look, if you're doing this for the first time, get the service manual for your bike because most of them have a very good description walking you through this. And they have pictures and stuff. And really, you can do that like on your first time just by stepping through the manual mm-hmm. um, step by step. And so, oh, and I guess... Uh, to get to the compression stroke, the compression stroke is is like it like it it, it sounds. It's as the uh, cylinder or the piston is compressing the mixture uh, into the cylinder, um, and that uh, as you're rotating it, um, just to if you can see the cam moving or the rocker arms moving, um, it is the uh, the stroke right after, uh, the intake valve is, uh, compressed, um, or opened. Um, and so if you see the intake valve, um, open, then the next rotation of the crank is going to be your compression stroke. And that's the one you want to find top dead center on. The reason for that is because the intake and exhaust uh, valves will be closed. And so that you want to find your adjustment when the intake valves are at its most closed. And that's, um, and, uh, you want to check to see, say, uh, if, uh, not on all systems, but if, uh, say a rocker arm is, is loose and there's that gap. And you want to make sure, uh, we didn't mention this, but you want to make sure that the motor is completely cold. These are all cold adjustments. Um, and uh, this, that way you get an, a- an accurate uh, uh, gap measurement or clearance have, measurement. Have you ever, so this is probably not, but I was just wondering, say you did a valve adjustment with the motor super hot, which would probably be impossible to do with it yeah. super hot anyways. But if you did that, how far could it be out of adjustment? from heat i mean it could be it could be i mean you're dealing with small tolerances here so it could be in the aspect of it it could be way off um because uh though like double what the spec is maybe uh do you know i I wouldn't be able to accurately yeah guesstimate that but enough enough to where you would be adjusting them out of adjustment yeah if you're adjusting them while hot when it's the specs are uh adjustments when they're cold i don't even think you could it'd be so hot that'd be yeah i mean it wouldn't be generally wouldn't be fun task anyways no um so um yeah and so uh um so let's talk about the first type, um, uh, uh, nut and tap it, uh, system with a rocker arm. Um, this system is probably the easiest to do out of all of them. Um, you can do it with a few simple tools. You generally will need, um, a wrench, uh, to loosen and, uh, uh tighten and hold the lock nut, um, which is, uh, usually a 10 millimeter. Yeah, it's usually right? a but 10. I'm sure it varies on different bikes. Yeah, I've seen some with 8 mil. That's, um, yeah, lock I think nuts I have as well. two. And then a flathead screwdriver, right. but sometimes it's a little square. Totally depends what the adjustment uh, screw or is. It could be a flathead, it could be a Phillips, it could be a little square post, different styles. So you'll need whatever tool is necessary to actually adjust it, and it'll be very obvious from looking at it. Your manufacturer actually, they made tools for this. Um, I know especially for like uh, the nut and tap, it's like um, they make a tool and it's a... Uh, 10 millimeter nut and inside of it is a flathead and so you just put it over yeah that'd the be nut cool. and tap it and it's one tool and you can hold the nut while you're screwing or you're loosening and tightening the screw the set screw basically in there which and, would be um, helpful but certainly yeah. not necessary yeah you don't need it do. but they make those tools as well It'd be which nice, nice to yeah have. Um, it's a it's a it can pretty Quantity, much, I yeah, guess. definitely. So to actually do your adjustment here, um, you have the motor at the right position, and you've picked your cylinder that you're doing this for. And so the first step is to loosen the lock nut, and by doing that, then the adjustment screw will move freely. Um, you want to start by taking uh, the measurement. Um, now, on this type of system, you don't necessarily have to know what where you were at because you can just adjust it to where you're supposed to be. But... 
I, uh, it's a good idea to go ahead and take the measurement first and see where you're at and write it down uh, yeah. and keep kind of like a maintenance record for the bike. So you'll be able to tell how much the valves moved, um, you know, at Since your baseline where you started. And then the next time you do it, you can compare how much they moved. So yeah. it's definitely just a good idea keeping to write a record it record and it could give you an I- a better idea how your bike uh, as far as like the amount of miles um, it takes to the valves to get out of adjustment. Um, yeah, because if you wrote it down there and then you did them in 7,500 miles and they didn't move much, you know, and then you did it your third time and they still didn't move much, like you kind of know you might be able to go a little further between adjustments yeah. if you're consistent. But anyway, it's always good information to keep on the bike. Plus, if you ever sell the bike and you have that kind of maintenance info, like that certainly always helps mm-hmm. give yeah. people peace of mind. And you can also also see if uh, it if your uh, particular motor tends to tighten up or uh, or or loosen. Right. Um, so so take your take your first measurement and see where you're at. And to do that, you're going to take your feeler gauge and you're going to slide it in uh, between the adjustment uh, screw and the um, and the top of the, the valve top stem. Of the, the valve stem, and you want to basically pick uh, pick one that will fit and work your way up, sliding them in between the gap until you get to the point where they are uh, just plain too big to fit. And then you want to go back down. You want to find the feeler gauge that has a a snug fit. You get a little bit of drag, but it still moves uh, freely in and out. And you want to feel just a little bit of drag on the the feeler gauge as you're uh, putting it in and out of the adjustment gap. Um, So once you do that and you know where you're at, write that down. And then look at your spec um, in your service manual that it's supposed to be at. And then you're going to take your feeler gauge for the correct spec and put it in the gap. And you want to tighten the adjuster down until you're snug against the feeler gauge but not tight and get back to that feeling where it's set correctly and you have just a little bit of drag on the feeler gauge moving it in and out. Yeah. Oh, Any and also another thing, that? too, uh, if, uh, say, you know that your uh, your gap over time uh, loosens or tightens, um, usually there will be um, a small tolerance of, uh, of, of a gap that is um, allotted. And so you can say if your uh, valves tend to loosen over time, you can set it to the tighter um, end of the tolerance. T- tighter end of the tolerance, and that might give you a little bit more adjustment um, for the future. So once you set it to the correct spot where you're happy with it, you want to tighten the lock nut back up. And you want to keep in mind that as you tighten the lock nut, you could be moving the adjustment screw a little bit. So you know, you need to keep a firm grip on the lock nut as you tighten it. Um, once you do a couple and you get used to it, you can even set the lock nut like a little on the loose side to allow for it tightening yeah. up as you, um, as you bring the lock nut down. So after you do this, you know, try it three or four times on your first one and make sure you get the feel of it. And, uh, you know, once you do your first one correctly and you're happy with it, they will all act the same way and you'll be a lot quicker with it. But take your time on the first one and make sure that you got it down. And then always recheck it once you're done. Once you have that lock nut tight, um, go back and check it again and make sure that the gap did not change. Yeah, the way I like to do it is I like to, whatever the spec is, that feeler gauge, I just put it in um, in between the top of the valve stem and the adjustment screw. And uh, and I leave it in there to when I'm tightening it down on there so I know that it's not... You know, so that when I'm done, move, when I'm done yeah. with it, it's it's still good. And you always recheck, like Evan said. And even with that, sometimes I I tighten it down too yeah. much. And well, you'll know if the feeler gauge doesn't yeah, want to come you, out. If it doesn't come done. out easily, <laughs> you did it too um, tight. But sometimes I do like opposing forces too. So yeah. when I'm tightening the nut, I'll be gently putting Backing the opposite the pressure adjuster, on the yeah. adjuster, and that usually works pretty good. But yeah, always recheck because the tolerances are so little that. I mean, we're talking millimeters and thousands here, depending on what you're looking at. No, we're talking like tenths of a millimeter. Mm -hmm. So it's very small. But, you know, just take your time on the first one and get the feel for it. Once you do it, and and as long as you always go back and check it when you're done to make sure that you got it right, you know, then it's no big deal. Maybe you screwed it up on the first time. Redo it. Take your time and make sure you get it down. All the others 
operate the same way. So once you uh, once you get your little system down, it'll be the same for all of them, and you'll be much quicker with them. All right, so um, that that about covers uh, your uh, rocker rocker arm type and uh, the nut and tap it type um adjustment so uh we and, definitely and enjoy those because they're easy. yeah yeah <laughs> definitely they uh they're very easy kind of pain-free when like uh, evan uh, it, uh said like once you get the feel for it it's 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 not not a difficult chore to do this at all once you get your first bike with a shim type you will appreciate these <laughs> yeah um, greatly exactly so um now uh the shims uh, the shim type uh we're going to be going through there's uh, pretty much two different types of shim types. There's a shim over bucket, uh, where the shim is on top of the bucket, and then there's shim under bucket, where the shim is as uh, under the bucket. So, um, we'll, uh, I guess, um, pretty much this next part I'm going to be telling you is going to be very confusing, and then we're going to go into hey, it. Let's, after looking at these notes, let's walk through the adjustment procedure first and then then do the example um do you think that makes more sense because you already like you can visualize what you're doing okay i agree i kind of went down did some notes down here uh of of that um so i'll pretty much um this is like an example exemplary oh i see this is just kind of a description of yeah, how it works exactly okay, so it, this is kind of right. uh a quick brief uh little um uh explanation on the uh, uh, the system and how it works as far as adjustment. So, um, for exemplary reasons, um, let's say if you need a 0.10 millimeter uh, clearance and you have a 0.05 millimeter clearance with a 270 shim or 2.7 uh, uh, seven uh, millimeter um, shim, you will need to replace that 270 shim with a 265 or 2.65 millimeter shim the two point or the two uh, 65 shim is thinner so that would add um, 0.05 millimeters to your current valve uh, clearance to give you 0.10 or 0.10 millimeter clearance so with that being said that's just a very quick uh, explanation on how this system is adjusted uh, now if uh, you've never done this before, uh, that will be very confusing, I'll, I'll and type we're up going to get into that description and the example, as well as one of the charts that we'll mention. And when you listen to this and then look at the example, because those numbers might not make sense yet, once you look at that all together, you'll understand what we're explaining here. Yeah. So that's just kind of a quick overview, and now we're going to blow that crap apart and explain in detail um, how you uh, how that was formed and how that adjustment was, uh, was done. So, um, with, uh, one thing to note, definitely, uh, with, uh, these are generally the shim types are on, uh, dual overhead cam motors. Um, and, uh, you, uh, will have to remove the valve cover to, uh, to get to them. It's the same process as we, uh, described earlier, as far as getting to the adjustment, um, but and, here, uh, here it's critical that you write down the starting the exactly. starting measurement. Um, On the but, other uh, other style, you're adjusting it no matter what, and there's no shims to add or, or uh, change, so it doesn't really matter uh, that you you don't have to know what you started with. But for this style, it's part of the math to figure out what you what shim you need. So you definitely have to record your uh, starting clearances. Yeah. Um, now, this is just a little quick note. When you are removing the valve cover, uh, be careful not to tear, uh, say, the paper gasket um, uh, that uh, is in between the valve cover and the heads. Um, this uh, it can tear easy, um, and uh, you can replay or can reuse this if it's still good and it's not like it's it's not separated and stuff like that. So, but if it does. Um, you do need to re, re, uh, replace it, uh, even if uh, if it tears at like a clean tear, and um, you want to put it back together. Like that will be a leak, uh, and and you will have an oil leak from that. So um, it's always best to be careful while doing this. Um, if you don't have to replace something, um, it's always better. Um, or if you want to, just go ahead and, and replace it anyways. Um, but make sure when you do, if it is a paper gasket, you remove all of the old paper gasket um, from the surfaces. Uh, and a lot of the times, too, they do have a rubber 
uh, gasket around it, um, which are pretty easy to take off, but getting them back on to fit properly can be a bit of a chore. Um, sometimes you can use a gasket sealant, or I'm sorry, gasket adhesive, um, to make it stick where you want it to be. So that's just a quick note. Um, and, um, do you want me to get into this, this first little part of the shim? Yeah, keep going. All right, so um, same process again. What you're doing is you're getting to uh, you want to get to uh, the top de- uh, to top dead center on the compression stroke of the cylinder that you are making your adjustment, or at this point checking your adjustment. Um, so uh, get to the uh, compression stroke on top dead center again and measure the clearance between. Uh, on this one, it's a little different. Uh, you want to measure from the cam lobe um, to the uh, top of the shim surface or the buck or the bucket surface, depending um, on the shim over bucket or shim under bucket. Actually, we'll just go over. It's the same process again, but. Uh, um, yeah, I guess we'll do c- this covering uh, shim over and under. Um, it's the same thing, but just, just to change the shims on exactly. the under bucket, you have it's to a remove the cams. Yeah, and um, so, but um, you're going to get your measurements the same way. Right? Yeah. Um, now, uh, uh, some uh, now when you're getting this measurement, uh, majority of the time it is the uh, the the distance between the cam lobe itself and the shim or shim bucket. Uh, on some systems, there uh, are uh, there are what looks like a rocker arm, um, that, which it generally it pretty much is. But in these cases, they're just called cam followers, um, and so it's the same same principle. They're just called two different things for these two different systems. Um, and uh, so once you have gotten those measurements, write down uh, the measurements. Uh, or clearances in relation to each valve per cylinder. So you want to do all of your measurements um, ahead of time before you start uh, making the adjustments, which are uh, changing shims. Um, so I usually just write down a little grid um, uh, E um, as as in exhaust, and then another which is um, I'm sorry, yeah, E as in exhaust, and then I as an in intake, and then just one, two, per three, cylinder. four, or how many cylinders there are. Sometimes there may even be uh, two uh, uh, two valves, two intake cylinder. valves per cylinder, so it's a four four valve system per cylinder, um, and so you want to make a, a I guess a grid for those as well so you want to make sure some of the yamahas have uh they used a five a five valve system on a lot of their 80s uh, bikes and some of the door oh, bikes really? too yeah yeah so you want to make sure that the measurement you're getting is per valve per cylinder and make sure it's something you can read easily and know that clearance because those are very important if you google valve um uh try like valve uh valve gap chart or valve clearance chart you'll find lots of in google images you'll find lots of like pre-made computer made charts that people made like that you can print out and they already have like the whole chart ready for you to write in your all your uh measurements and then what you need and stuff so i mean obviously you can just sketch out a little chart easily but there's tons of them online if you just want to print one out and you'll have it all you know Print it out nicely for yeah, you to write definitely. your measurements in. Yeah, so if you're the type of person that wants to be really kind of well, if it works out better for you to do something like that, that is that's available as well. Um, so moving uh, moving on to um, now, um, once you have all of your adjustments per shim, I'm sorry, per valve per cylinder, uh, then uh, you want to start removing uh, those shims. And uh, I, I think I mentioned it a little, or I'll mention it a little later. But um, uh, remember, if you don't have to uh, replace a shim or swap out a shim, don't remove it. Um, this is kind of not a not a difficult process, but it can be frustrating at times and it can be tedious. So. Uh, the less work you can do on this, the the better off you are. And a lot of times, um, you can get uh, you can get by with. Like once you make your chart and you have all your clearances and everything, you'll realize that you can swap shims. Right. To I got that in there. Oh, but sorry. Yeah, but I'm just saying that. Yeah. But um, how much um on a, like let's just say a CB 
dual overhead cam motor. How much are the shims? You got to go buy sizes, different sizes. Um, well, it, it depends. We're we'll we'll get into that uh, at, towards the end, um, just so we don't have to repeat or or go into that. But oh, you have where to get shims yeah. in here. Okay. Um, so um, I don't think I've ever bought. I've got. I a have. Set. I all, the only time I ever do these regularly is on dirt bikes, and they all the Japanese bikes use like pretty much the same size. Yeah. So I've got a lot of the. I've got a big box of them, and mm-hmm. I never buy them. I yeah. bought, um, bought a box one time of every common size, and I never bought them after that. Yeah. So we'll we'll get into in a little bit um, uh, where uh, you are replacing these or or getting these additional shims that you need. You're measuring your gap when your cam lobe is pointing directly away from the bucket right yeah when so you're measuring from at the bottom of the cam lobe and the top of the yeah shim. otherwise i mean yeah otherwise there wouldn't be any clearance yeah. yeah i just wanted to clarify that yeah but i mean regardless even if uh you aren't looking for that uh that's it's um, if if you're at top dead center um on the compression stroke both valves will be uh, sh- uh closed again and so um you're just taking that measurement but there might be um um yeah, and that's for, assuming like your cam timing is is accurate right. as well for the visual people. Yeah, your uh, cam lobe is going to be facing 180 degrees away from the top of the. Yeah, shim. not always, because um, cam timing can be a little different. It's not always going to be like directly the farthest away, uh, because they do open and close at different times. Yeah, I don't that's think true. that's a safe bet. Yeah, to know it, but it will always be at a fully low point. Exactly. On the it, yeah, definitely. You know, it may not be 180 degrees off, but it will be at a fully low yeah. spot. Um, so, uh, removing, uh, the shim, uh, this is, uh, removing the shim over bucket type. Um, so, uh, this one is definitely a lot, uh, it's, it has, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's necessarily easier than, uh, shim, uh, under bucket, but it's just, I'd say they're equally kind of, a pain. Um, but I mean, you, once you do this a few times and you just kind of know what to expect, it's, it gets easier and less frustrating and less dreadful, I guess I should say. So, um, so now, um, with, uh, with the, um, uh, cam position still, um, away from, uh, the, uh, the shim, um, do you want to rotate the bucket itself until there'll be a little notch in the bucket um, that you want to make sure that is facing outwards or somewhere where you can um, uh, get access to it. Um, and so I'm sure when you're looking at it, this will make sense. It's just a little notch somewhere where you can get underneath the shim uh, to pop it out. Um, will the bucket rotate with your fingers? Like you can kind of grab it and spin it? Uh, for the most part, I've yeah, had sometimes. like very rarely. I've, I've had issues where it's very tight and difficult to move. Yeah. Um, but it's not necessarily a very close, like fit or taller. It's a close fit, but it's not right. enough to where it's actually. Um, and if it is, it, it may be a uh, cause for concern because you don't want the that bucket to be rubbing on the spring, right? Because um, that does kind of sleeve over the spring, the valve springs. Um, so uh, once you've, ro- you've rotated the knot so it's facing outwards, uh, you rotate the crank till the cam lobe is pressing down on that particular shim uh, and shim bucket. Um, now we'll get into there's uh, a f- uh, once this is done, you've, you've pretty much you've opened the valve um, and uh, and compressed uh, the valve down. And so um, now is where you want to hold that shim bucket. Uh, in place, um, and uh, there are many different, uh, many different, or manufacturers tend to have different uh, shim tools for this. And what you're uh, uh, essentially are, are all trying to achieve the same thing, which is holding the shim bucket in place, um, so that you can rotate the cam back around to get the shim out. Exactly. So when you're holding the shim bucket in place. You rotate the crank again to rotate the cam, um, uh, releasing the the pressure off of that shim and shim bucket. So there's no room. I've never done this style before. There's no room to pop the shim out with the cam at its biggest gap point. No, uh, no, not enough because you're 
your measurement, like in the example, oh, that's, yeah, 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 right. it's much smaller sure. than, yeah. the than the shim. Okay, because usually you're dealing with over two millimeter right uh, shims, right, right. And the you're, you're dealing with very. So small how do mil- the tools work? Like that valve spring's fairly stiff. Like how well, how does the tool work to hold it down? Basically, what the tool looks like is like imagine like a scythe, kind of. It's basically okay. like a stick with like a cupped kind of okay. piece on it and yeah. so when the lobe is down you jam it on like the, a sickle yeah yeah you jam it on the side of the bucket like on the rim of the bucket yeah but make sure that you're not on the, the actual shim, shim. yeah mm. and it sits it just wedges right under in, right under the cam uh shaft and above the bucket yeah so then when you rotate the the cam back around the lobe is sticking up but the force is still pushing the bucket down so it is so it uses it's basically crammed in between the cam and the bucket. It's basically not yeah. allowing the cam, the the bucket to come back up. Yeah, the, the valve to it's holding. And that doesn't place. like like scratch up the the cam lobe no. at all. No, I mean you're on this. No, you're not actually on the cam lobe surface. You're, you're on, the, on the cam shaft. Yeah, the shaft. Oh, okay. but not on the lobe itself. So it puts pressure on the cam off to the side. Exactly. Basically. Right. Okay. All right. Um, now that's one. Sis- that's one way. Um, or one style of tool. There's also tools um, that it pretty much goes, it holds down the outside. It's kind of like a little fork almost that holds the outside of the can, uh, the shim bucket. And then you like screw it onto one of the uh, uh, bolts that hold the valve cover on um, or a, uh, so there's other there's a lot of different there's systems, different ta- yeah. yeah. And so uh, you, it's the, the tools are always very cheap and very inexpensive. So uh, get your hands on one of those. Um, get your hands yes. on one of those. Very um, similar. I see. Yeah. So look it up. Um, yeah. And uh, and make sure you get the right uh, shim tool for your your specific motor. Another trick that I've learned for that. Um, yeah, and you can make these too. Yeah, I made mine. Well, I made mine off of an original one because I had to give it back to somebody, so I mm. just made it out of a piece of aluminum. But um, another trick you can do is you can get like a long zip tie and fold it in half a couple times on one end, and then like put some duct tape around it, and you have your spark plug out already. So when your lobe is all the way when it's compressed, same kind of thing. Um, put that spark or that zip tie down the spark plug so that it uh, rests on top of the piston and as you rotate it but make sure you can pull it out obviously you're not going to lose it in there and as you're um, rotating the cam back up it's going to leave a little spacer in there so that it doesn't uh, come back up I, am I um, I'm not way? following you at all you're putting it in there and it's basically like a spacer like the same kind of thing but it's just internally or it's on top of the the valve actually so the valve doesn't close all the way Oh I see so you're just putting your space you're you're forcing a gap for yes. the between the valve and the valve seat Right internally Okay. With a little I, piece of plastic. I, I wouldn't mean, necessarily recommend this uh, as your first choice. That, I, yeah. Um, I've, I've, just because there's tendencies that that could – it could break the zip tie in, yeah. and then you're screwed. Um, and you pretty much have to disassemble um, that valve to get it out. But, I've, yeah, I've never heard of that. Yeah, so. I've heard of it um, and I've, I tried it once. That was before I had the tool, and then I was able to get the tool, so I stopped doing yeah. that. Yeah. In a bind, I, I, I would say – that that's an option, but we're not going to recommend that as your first choice because yeah, there's, first choice. there's a lot of there's a lot of issues that could be um, that is a for pain that. In the ass. So I'm, I'm looking at a video of, of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, moving back on to removing the uh, um, removing the shim um, from the shim over bucket type. Um, so once you have that notch facing outwards and you've compressed the um, compress the shim and shim bucket um, to where it opens the valve from the crank or from uh, the cam lobe or cam follower, depending on the system. Um, Now with the shim tool in place, uh, you want to rotate the crank again until the cam lobe or cam follower is, uh, has relieved all of the pressure from um, uh, pretty much uh, uh, just a safe way to do it is just going back to top dead center on your compression stroke. Um, and now, uh, you can fit a, 
uh, a thin uh, flathead screwdriver um, in between that notch and the shim itself. And what you're going to do is just popping that, trying to pop that shim out. Um, and uh, generally, they will be pretty easy to come out. Uh, they almost will want to. Uh, sometimes it'll be, uh, there's like a little vacuum created just from oil being in there. And um, so it can be a little hesitant to come out. But uh, you want to pull those out. Try not to be too um, forceful too because forceful, you don't want to score or damage any surfaces um, or, or warp anything. I've also used like... I've pried it up with a flathead, but I couldn't get it out with that. So mm-hmm. little like grabbing tweezers. Yeah, um, exactly. Grab it out or even that like a little magnet wand. Needle nose pliers. Yeah, needle those will work. But out. I mean, those, those can be pretty, have pretty sharp edges too. So again, you want to make sure you don't score anything or, uh, and pull those out as gently as possible. A little magnetic stick works too. Yeah. Cause they're metal. Yeah. So they magnetize. Just like a 15 pound magnet or something like that yeah. can work. Um, so once you've popped out the shim, uh, you want to write down the shim size that's on the uh, bottom side. Generally, it sh- well, it should always be on the bot. That number should be on the bottom side of that shim, um, and you want to write that down corresponding to the valve and uh, to the valve that that came off of um, in reference to that cylinder as well. Um, and so you write this down. So say. Um, uh, say it is, uh, it has 270. So you want to write down in your, uh, if it's came out of the, uh, intake number one cylinder, uh, you would write down, uh, 170 that's in there now. Um, and then, uh, say the number on the bottom of the shim is not legible. Um, you can get a set of calipers and measure, the uh measure the the width not the width the uh height of that uh shim and say that for example it's 2.7 millimeters that is equal to a two number 270 shim uh and um i don't think i've written this down uh, for future conversation but uh um shim sizes uh they are in intervals of five so there's a uh, 250. 270, 275, 280. So they go in intervals of five. And those, and that five is in reference to 0.05 millimeters. Um, and so, um. And they do this, they do it this way. Um, and then that's why you'll have a tolerance on your valve gapping because you're not going to be able to get exactly every time with this style mm-hmm. of shim. So, um, <clears throat> so say you need, to have or say you have like a 250 and your tolerance is like well i don't know where i'm going with this but yeah, basically I, I would you're not gonna to, we're gonna you go use the closest the shim yeah available you get the, yeah. you, you get it to the spec. closest at the at the interval of five or zero basically yeah so we'll uh we're getting close to breaking down uh almost the math uh to i don't i don't like to, to read this. ahead so i know i was, I was never everyone. the read ahead guy in school <laughs> Uh, so, um, again, uh, a little kind of warning for this is something to look out for is be careful not to force anything, uh, especially when you are relieving the pressure from the, uh, shim bucket, um, and shim, um, when, with the tool in place, uh, if it feels like binding, it is binding. And so again, valve, valve train components are very expensive. And so you can, uh, can break things easily and uh and it's wise to do your best not to i've used once you remove all the shims i've used uh egg crates a lot of time or like egg cartons you know to put the shims in and then i mark them you know i cut them up into groups of four you know what i'm talking about and i'll put like my intake in the in the oh, back yeah. one and then my exhaust in the front one and then i just write on there with a mm. sharpie or something yeah. i'm pretty yeah. sure that you don't want to take them all out at the same time though well, you yeah, to, you want to take out one and put it in, and then do the next one. Well, okay, no, but I my wouldn't. experience is always coming from doing it on dirt bikes, where you have to remove the cams anyway. Oh, well, so that's I always different. have all of them out at the yeah. same time. Yeah, I mean, so. I've I've always, I mean, I've always done it for me. I've always removed um, all of them at the same time that need to be adjusted, and that's why I write down the number of what cor- like what was in there before. Yeah, um, in reference to that that valve per that cylinder, and so if 
if uh, so that way um, when I have all the shims removed, chances are there might be one or two that are, need to be adjusted that were in there already that I can use for another um, to to oh, yeah. make another valve. So it might be good to have all of them out that yeah. you're going to be adjusting. So yeah, you but swap you, them. You're, I don't I don't think you're supposed to have the shim out and then rotate the cam and have it pushed down on the bucket again. I think oh, that's, that that's an, a good point. bad thing. Because mm. so what I've done, and so what I've done, because I've done this where I've been able to swap shims. You stick the tool in, and then pull that shim out, and then you can leave that tool in there to get so you can rotate it so it's not hitting the bucket. Oh, to keep the bucket away from. And the then cam. that's when I made the other one, and I jammed it under on the other bucket so i have but you would have to have two tools yeah. right yeah i just said i made oh you tool. had another tool okay and then i swapped those but also when you're doing this too uh well we'll get into this later but if you have an extra one you or if you can get one then you have no problem because you can mm. swap one take one put it somewhere else it's but like would one slow rotation of the cam on the bucket with no shim in it really do any damage you know i don't know i've just I, always read and been told that you not shouldn't do yeah, that. yeah, I can understand that. Um, for me, I don't always like as far as my personal bikes. I don't necessarily. I I think I've had one personal bike that's had like a shim style um, system, and so generally when I'm doing this, uh, I'm rebuilding the motor. Yeah, so it's and a so part. a lot of the times I already have. I get my adjustments and I I pull the cams because I'm going to anyways when and I rebuild it. And in that it. case, it's fine. If you yeah. have your numbers and everything, then that's fine. Exactly. But if you're still, like, your cam's all hooked up with the chain and everything, mm. you're not supposed to remove more than one. Or you're not supposed to let the, the lobe hit the bucket. Yeah. Because it's bad for the bucket. On on a shim over, well, yeah, I guess yeah. a shim under uh, bucket would be a different story anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, well, um, that's a good point Jared brought up. I, I actually wasn't aware of that. And, um, um uh, I think Jared, you actually do have more experience than I do with the shim, the shim style. Well, yeah, because the KZ yeah, sucks. Exactly. Um, I most of my I experience, learned my lesson with it. Most of my experience comes from when I'm actually rebuilding the motor to begin with. So I don't necessarily go with this process, and because I haven't had too many um, shim style motorcycles. So um, yeah, with uh, uh, I would just the safe bet to do is is do as as um as Jared was saying, um and uh, replacing the appropriate shim, um, uh before you start moving to other uh, valves. Well, yeah, you check it, and then you ch- that's why you check all of them first, and then if you can just get one extra shim, say you have two that can be swapped, you can put a shim that's too big in to make it tight. Just so you can pull out another one to swap it. Yeah. Because you're not going to be running it at this tolerance as long as when you're done, everything is good. Yeah. So you can put bigger shims or smaller shims in opposite places to be able to free up room. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But so are we ready to talk about um, where we get shims or we want no, to? No, not yet. Okay. We're going to – now we're going to go through um, – uh, let's see, um, kind of like the math and how to find and get your adjustment. Um, so again, we're going to use that same, uh, example, um, just of the math, uh, or just these numbers to kind of go through the math, uh, to get the, uh, appropriate, uh, tolerance or, uh, uh, clearance, uh, for your, for your valves. Um, so again, this is exemplary, um, Example? Exemplary. Exemplary. Yeah, uh, I should this never, is an example. Yeah. This is an example <laughs> of uh should not use words that I don't know how to say. Um of uh some uh some clearance uh sp- some spec clearance numbers and we're gonna base it off of this. So um and this is again just one valve and one cylinder. Um so say that the clearance that we um our target clearance that we're shooting for is Point one, um, point one uh, millimeters. So that's our that's our spec. And say we measured 
Um, originally, when the, we were taking our first measurements, we measured 0.05 millimeters. And um, from removing the uh, shim and looking to see what number shim is in there, we found that we had a 270 or a, a 2.7 millimeter shim um, in there currently. And so the difference in that, uh, the difference between what we measured and the clearance that we're, our target is, is 0.05 millimeters. And that would be a tight Exactly. A so tight that would be, um, we would be, uh, um, let's see. 0.5 under. We would be 0. 0.05 yeah, 0. over 0.05. Um, in the shim size. Um, so what you want to do is since that, that is a tight clearance, uh, we want to, um, get a smaller size shim in there to make up the difference. And so we will be replacing it with a 265 or 2.65 millimeter shim. And that will make up the difference, uh, of the 0.05, uh, we originally had to achieve our 0.1 millimeter clearance and that's our target clearance so you're subtracting the difference from the current shim to get the replacement correct exactly or you'll be adding or to the shim say if we had a 0.15 millimeter clearance of what we measured we would get a two uh a 275 um uh shim in place of that to make up to um make up for that distance because so that would you, be a loose valve. Exactly. Right. Yeah. If your clearance is too well, just if your clearance is too big, uh, you want to raise your shim. If your clearance is too tight, then you want to uh, lower your shim. Um, so get a smaller shim. Get a smaller shim or a bigger shim if it's too loose. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I know it, it might be a little difficult to follow that exactly just by uh, audibly hearing it. Um, but when you're looking at it, it'll start to make sense. Yeah, definitely. And so when you um, when you measure or you mark all of the um, number or the number of shim or numbers, excuse me, when you have written down the number shim you have in each valve. Um, then you want to do your math, and that's the math you're going to be doing. And so you're making those all uh, into your target clearance. I'll write up, like, I'll make it into, like, a formula, basically, that you could yeah. plug in the number into a spot. Yeah, and again, there are also uh, shim charts uh, or shim uh, clearance or adjustment charts uh, that can kind of do this math in a grid format. Um, I, I find them kind of... Not necessarily confusing, but I, I have no issue doing it this way to find my no, difference. No, I think confusing is a fair... No, yeah. they are confusing. <laughs> and when you're looking at it at first, it doesn't make any sense. But once you start looking at your shims and you get your clearances yeah. in, it, in your head, it starts... All the information's coming together. Yeah. Once you figure out the chart, it's like, oh, that's super easy. Because mm-hmm. on one side, it's got your clearances. Um, and then on the other, on the top side, it has uh, what shim you have in there now. And then you just follow the grid to where it meets, and it'll tell you what shim you need. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. And so this this uh, uh, math um, also um, falls in line with the shim under bucket uh, system as well. And so we're just gonna briefly the 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 only the only difference between the shim over bucket and shim uh, under bucket uh, process is to swap out and to check your shims, uh, you have to remove the cams. So you have to remove the cams to actually lift the bucket off of the, um, off of the shim that is resting on top of the top of the valve stem. Um, and so it's a little bit more of a pain sometimes, but if you're doing honestly, a rebuild, I honestly would rather take the cams off and then, because it's not really, yeah, there is the um, trouble, I guess, of making sure when you put it back on, the cam timing is uh, is is uh, accurate. And um, but I mean, again, there in your manual, um, there it should give you step by step process. There's usually timing marks and cami marks for what you want to line yeah. to the in reference to the flywheel or crank that um, uh, to get the cam timing properly. 
or uh, or uh, accurate. So uh, that's the difference between the shim under bucket and uh, uh, the shim over bucket style. Um, now I guess uh, we can move on to uh, where to get your shims. Um, well, with the shims, they're hardened steel. So if you have shims and you say, "Oh, I'm just going to grind it down," don't don't do that. Yeah, because then that's just not a good thing. Um, well, and it's and you're tall. You're not going to get it perfect to what you need. Yeah. So not only that, but it's it, it's going to be very difficult to get an even surface. And it's just going to make them brittle, and then they're going to crack, and yeah. then it's you're just. You're just going to cause problems for yourself. Shims aren't very expensive. Um, where you can get them, a lot of shops uh, will do. They'll swap you shim for shim, um, so you can go in there and say, "Hey, I have this shim and this shim," uh, and you know, see what they have in their back stock. Mm-hmm. And they're all going to be, for the most part, they're probably going to be used because these are all old bikes. Yeah. Um, and used ones are fine. I mean, yeah, if, you wanna, if you want to make sure that it's still, that shim is still within its tolerance, just take some calipers with you and measure it. Uh, a 270 again will read a 2.7 millimeter, um, uh, in, uh, in width. In height. In height, excuse me. In thickness. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so you can get them, um, and it doesn't, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off again, it. but, uh, um, the only thing that matters are two things is the height of them. You want to get the height that you need and, and the also width. the diameter of, um, of, uh, of that shim. So, uh, it's, uh, you don't necessarily have to go in and say, I have a 1980, uh, CB 750. Uh, I need, I need shims for that. You can just bring in, say, your shim and, um, and, and uh, they can use the measurement of the shim, the diameter of that, to to find a shim for you rather than... You just uh, need to make specific. sure that the diameter is the same because exactly. that's very important. Yeah. Um, so, like, local, your local mechanic shop or whatever should have them. Um, actually, well, yeah, most bikes, they'll have them. Some bikes, like the KZ750 Twin that I had, uh, had 32 millimeter, or thir- the... The diameter was 32 millimeters. And so that's a really big shim. Um, and it was like one of the only bikes that it was used in. So finding those was a pain. Mm-hmm. But you can swap them shim for shim at yeah. a mechanic or a local shop. Um, you can buy them online new. You can buy shim kits, and it's just a big-ass box yeah, with um, just every a- single size and mm-hmm. multiple ones. Um, or you can you know go on eBay and... There's shims on eBay. People sell them just like any other part. Yeah. And so if you know what shims you need, you just search that. But just make sure that you're getting the correct uh, thickness and diameter for your bike. Um, those. That that's the only thing that I can say. Yeah. Um, how much would you say shims are? Well, like uh, five to ten bucks, maybe. Yeah, but if I probably say around that, but I know that for the Kawasaki. Um, since it was a rare shim size, they're mm-hmm. very big and nobody carries them. Uh, I bought mine on eBay or I was reading in forums and I saw people buying them for 20 to $30 a wow. shim. Oh, wow. Because they're 32 millimeter shims or something like that. Yeah. Will a um, dealership swap them with you? Yeah, but they don't carry them oh, because they don't have them. that was. Uh, yeah, I don't think a dealership would necessarily because they generally deal with new stuff and they won't swap unless they had new old stock which right yeah so i've actually never i've i've never i've bought in a kit before um i don't remember how much it was but i've always just shot or swapped shim to shim and i never really had to pay for anything i bet forums would be a good place to look forums are a really good place and because yeah on forums there will be people especially if it's dedicated for your bike yeah there's people they've all done that yeah they probably had to get new shims so they have leftover shims and they just send them you know swap them in the mail or send them to you for cheap or whatever we we went in like well it's probably easier with dirt bikes that all use the same size but with a group of like four or five of us guys that i used to ride with a lot we all just split a complete shim kit between all of us and and you know you get like four or five of each size and Mm -hmm. it was probably 200 300 bucks or something and we just split it like five ways and passed it around yeah and 
Yeah, that may not be time. like. Oh, well, you guys probably also device, could have just but... swapped out your guys' gyms between each other. Yeah, but we a lot of times didn't need too, to have that many sites. We bought like what a dealership would probably buy. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of the know. times, was, I mean, you're because for the most part, your bike is going to be out of commission until you get the uh, appropriate shims that you need. So right. maybe a local spot would be um, best option. Or, um, or, or purchasing a shim kit. And chances are that shim kit should last you for the entire life of your bike. Um, for the most part. And so, um, the good thing about the, the shim style systems is they, they don't, uh, lose their, uh, tolerance or their clearances. Uh, as often as, uh, say, the nut and tappet style. And um, the reason that you want to put the number on the bottom yeah. is so that the cam isn't wearing that number exactly. off right. yeah. when it's spinning around. And so, And if, again, uh, if that number is worn off, uh, say, the previous um, per, uh, person who adjusted it, put it the wrong way. Um, just measure with just calipers. Just measure with the calipers. So, um, I'm going to post this on the... On the uh, website, but I just wrote out the formula for um, figuring out what shim you need. So, uh, th- I mean, it's good to step through the math and know how to figure it out so you understand what the numbers are. But you could plug it in. Uh, it's pretty simple. You can you do this in millimeters. So instead of a 270, you're going to use 2.70. Um, so for uh, the formula is the shim needed in millimeters will be the current shim in millimeters minus the clearance spec in millimeters minus the clearance measured in millimeters. And then you're going to do that subtraction, multiply the whole thing by 100, and you will end up with the shim number. That multiplying it by 100 will take it back out of millimeters and into the three-digit shim number yeah. that you'll find. Yeah, that's actually – I just looked at that real quick, and that's it's a, it's a great and formula. And that will take care. Doing it that way will give you the right number whether you're going up or down mm-hmm. too. So that's and a, again, a quick too, way to like, do it. Uh, like we said earlier, you're not going to get your exact clearance spec. Right. It's going to be in – Five or zero, right? So yeah, and the, you always want to there. There so is some tolerance. There, yeah, it, that that yeah. is the tolerance. So exactly. if you get in there anywhere, like what I like to do is say I measured, like the example earlier, uh, it was, um, it was a clearance spec of point one millimeters. Say I measured point seven millimeters. I'm yeah. just gonna say I measured point five. Mm, yeah, you know because that's the closest that I'm gonna get. Yeah, but you wanna you wanna make sure like. Round up or round down um, within that uh, that clearance tolerance. Yeah, right. So say it's a uh, one point. I'm sorry, uh, point uh, point oh eight to point one uh, clearance tolerance. Um, those are uh, the worst numbers I chose to. Yeah. Yeah, the just example, well, you'll you'll just you'll understand, you'll understand, understand and yeah. see what's going to bring you closest into the the um, into the tolerance. Or We're exactly. not very good at math, so, so. Off the, basically, off the what you'll do is plug the numbers into this formula, see what you come up with, and then you will pick the closest one that yeah. brings you into range. The, the puts Whichever you one in that range, to, yeah. So, um, yeah, and again, double check all of your measurements. Uh, it's always best when you only have to do this once. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, that is that is it for um, valve adjustment. Um, hopefully, uh, this uh, makes a lot of, makes sense to you and uh, gives you uh, gives you the confidence to go out and uh, adjust your valves. And uh, do you know what? This is going to save you a shitload of money. Shops charge. Oh, yeah, this is hundreds um, of dollars. Yeah, charge anywhere from three to six hundred dollars to to do this job. And if you have all the parts. Or like if you have the extra shims or whatever, you could do this job and yeah, on well, the on nut the and long tap it side. system. You can do it uh, if you're if you've gotten it down. You can do it in half hour to forty five minutes. Oh yeah, yeah. easy. Yeah, so, with the shim and bucket, yeah. you could do this at the maximum side five hours. I'd say if you had all the tools, yeah, or you had all the parts, or if even if you have to wait a cumulative time, of, yeah. of five hours kind of thing. Yeah, 
So. Well, and yeah, that's on the extreme side. I mean, yeah. you, if you get this down, you can do it in, I'd say, hour to two hours. Yeah. But at least you can listen to this and know what tools you need and stuff. Like, this mm-hmm. is the kind of thing I would jump into on a CB and not know that I needed the, the, the like tool shims to hold even. the bucket down <laughs> or shims and I would, this would turn into a two week job. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, <laughs> what was it? Uh, yeah. And not only can it save you a lot of money, but, uh, valves are one thing that, um, you can, dramatically tell the improvement on how it runs and how yeah, uh, sure. and uh and the the amount of power um and uh and especially say it's uh you have a kickstart bike only or or even you just tend oh, to kickstart yeah. your bike a lot you'll notice uh, how it starts it'll start a lot better and quicker well, yeah valve adjustment is primarily the main thing that not the main thing but it's it's one of it's on the top of the list of things that affects how easy it is to kick a kick over a bike um so uh keep that in mind and um uh yeah i think that's that's about it for valve adjustment yeah that's a lot of info we get any uh emails um well we need to mention uh we're gonna be at uh the saturday school um that's right if you're in the uh uh southern california area um in Ven- Ventura, Venice, Venice, no, yeah, it's in Venice. Venice, in the LA area. I'm gonna, I'll post it uh, tonight. Um, it's on the fifth Saturday, April fifth, this coming Saturday, at um, Deus Ex Machina. At, yeah, Deus at their uh, Venice location at the um, garage, and it's called Saturday School. They're doing uh, a bunch of different like manufacturers and uh, probably some shops and stuff. Are gonna have booths and do like tech help and demos and stuff uh, it, it sounds pretty cool so we're gonna have a booth there set up for um for motorbike mondays and race tech and seaweed and we're trying to f- figure out exactly what we're gonna do for it but we'll have some cool stuff there to yeah show you. so we'll probably be doing some uh, some demonstrations or possibly even getting a piece of shit to run yeah uh, we're, we're still figuring it out and seeing what we'll we'll actually be able to do so but come it's, by uh, and, and see us it's what time be is it it's uh 11 to 5 11 on, to 5 on saturday so there'll be barbecue beer uh bikes Music, live babes band. and buttheads yeah it'll be fun so come out there if you're uh in the area come meet us and hang out for a little bit it'll be a good time um let me see i don't know let me look. I don't know that we have anything too important to read. Um, I think we already read that. Um, yeah, I think that was uh, that was really it. Is that show? Um, I did change. I had a guy ask that he listens to the podcast through a read, like a podcast reader program or something. It must not be iTunes. I don't know what it was. But he was asking, I had the, the website set so our feed for the show that is what iTunes picks up only has the light, latest 10 episodes in it. And the guy wanted to be able to download all of them through his reader. And so he could mm. only get the last 10 episodes. And now that we're at like 16 or 17, he wanted to be able to get all of them on his app or program or whatever. So anyways, I changed the feed on the website so it will now um, send out up to 100 episodes. And we'll see. I didn't want it to get like too cluttered, but... You know, I guess there's really no reason to not have yeah. it yeah, supply exactly. up to 100 episodes would be fine. So, anyways, uh, all of them except the first one or two, maybe. Well, Just make that happen. At this point, they're it's gonna <laughs> ha- it's gonna list all of them. Yeah. So if because uh, I I I always thought I guess I don't look at iTunes very often. Does iTunes still list them all the way back to episode one? Uh, I don't. Know. I do it on my my. I just have the podcast yeah. app. Yeah. I don't use it, so I don't know. Um, but anyways, and you can always listen. You can stream the show on the website, so that's always a way to do it. If uh, if you don't want to use iTunes or uh, an app on your phone or something, um, so yeah. Anyways, that's uh, that's about it. Thanks for uh, listening to episode seventeen, all about valve adjustments, and we will be back next uh, next week with something interesting, and we'll See definitely talk Saturday about this school. show. So come check us out on Saturday and uh, hang out and have some beers. All right. All right. Later, guys. Cheers.